Tools. Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we have the pleasure to have Benedict and Luca from Espresso here. And we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between the two projects. I'm by no means an, a sequencer or Espresso specialist, but you know, I've, we had a conversation before and I read a bit their docs and I'm going to present what I learned from a Cartesi person perspective. And later they can correct all the misunderstandings I had or add more. And also be, during the conversation, the presentation, feel free to interrupt or make any comments, suggestions. So uh, we're going to describe very briefly uh, sequencers and how sometimes it's implemented. The difference between the usual way they're done and the Espresso design, as far as I could understand. Espresso has few APIs that you have to go through. One is between L2 and uh, the Espresso network uh, that we call Hotshot here, as they call it. And then Hotshot 2L1 is another API. There's another API from L2 to L1 that we'll briefly mention. And then we'll talk about the, the separation between proposer and builder that is fully compatible with the Espresso system and will help us towards uh, potential integration. And talk a little bit about the financial incentives, how transactions are paid for in terms of gas and so on. So this is a very sketchy uh representation of what uh sequencers look like so the end users usually sit here with some sort of metamask or some other way to sign transactions uh, let's say it's metamask so this would supposed to be some json api uh pointing and metamask is pointing to some chain id specific to that l2 and then there is some centralized server that is actually carrying a lot of weight usually it's doing the sequencing so receiving these transactions and storing them for later submission to the 12 one executing these transactions to make sure that the user is paying for the gas that will be necessary later on when you send it to l1 and also offering this endpoint right this is a json api that is being communicated with uh I didn't fully understand, but in some projects, I think this also, the same node also does the whole uh, validation and uh, fraud proof in case there's a dispute. So this is carrying a lot of weight. If not, then there is a separate process doing execution and validation outside. We definitely do this. Uh, for people who are not familiar with Cortez, we have uh, one node that is, called the reader node, which is the only one the users interact with, and a validator node that is closed to the outside world. It doesn't have an outside looking interface and it only deals with L1 and performs fraud proofs and enters disputes if necessary. It's more of an enclosed node. So you see users sign transactions they send this transaction already signed to the sequencer they store it uh, they check if the balance of the person matches the fees they are signed uh, for l1 data availability uh, payments and then they bundle these transactions uh, and send the transactions together with a claim since they have an execution environment here they send it together with a claim which is also not the case for Cartesi. Cartesi, these bundled transactions arrive to L1, and later the validator will be responsible for making claims. So it's a, it's a separate thing. It's, if the sequencer gets attacked, you, you lose the ability to send bundled transactions to L1, but it's not the case that you ever receive a, a false claim that you have to dispute uh, at this stage here. Um, you see that the execution of the rollup is tied to the sequencing. And this is bad because, uh, okay, if you are running as a mono, 
monolithical L2, that's fine because you, your execution is basically one EVM. It's not a huge endeavor to run this in the same machine as your sequencing. But as soon as you go to the app chains, execution means execution of many different things, right? You can have a DAP1 here, DAP2, DAP3, and you have to be elastic, like we worry a lot about in Cartesian. So this elasticity makes it so that the execution will have to be separated from the sequencing. Otherwise, the sequencer will have to be part of a much bigger infrastructure. So this is what actually uh, Espresso has already uh, paid attention to. So this is a very, probably wrong, but uh, you know, simplified version of what happens in Espresso. The users in Espresso could talk directly to Espresso, but this is not usually the case. Usually they talk directly to some L2 node. Um, this node will do, in this slide at least, execution and offer this API for the user. Uh, and they, the node will talk back and forth, you see this is a double side arrow that we're going to talk a bit more about later, through some REST API to Espresso, which in its turn talks to L1, and the validator talks to L1 directly without uh, having any contact with the user. Uh, as whenever I mean Espresso or Hotshot, I mean it's a network, it's a decentralized sequencer, right? So this is a network that has some consensus mechanism to know what goes into L1 and so on. But for the purpose of this talk and most of the integration, I think we can think of Espresso as a centralized entity. So users will now interact with uh, this L2 node, but you see there's a big difference here. This L2 node uh, is the app specific. So if you have, because there's not something that is bad in this picture, you see that there is this box underneath talking to Espresso, but there are several others doing exactly the same, right? Espresso was designed from day one to talk to several different rollups and make the sequencing for all of them together. So this could be Arbitrum, this could be Optimism, but this could be several depth chains as well, right? Cartesi RPG that was developed uh, by some game community and then some DFI also running on Cartesi uh, technology. All of these are treated the same by Espresso. So you see already that there is a separation of, even though we are running the execution, there is a separation that allows us to run the execution of a single dApp. So this L2 node is for the dApp and not for the, the whole infrastructure, not something elastic. Then the users will send their transactions as usual to this node. This node will do a little dance with Espresso that I'm gonna talk about in more detail. Espresso is gonna put a block to L1 that actually contains data from all these rollups in principle, and later we'll talk about uh, how validation works, how we dissect this meta block here. Uh, but for the time being, it's I wanted to emphasize that we separated the apps into different uh, nodes. So I think I talked about all the points here. Please, Luca. Yeah, just a, a quick comment, and, and it's not that important, but the the current way that Espresso works is that it only sends block commitments to the layer one, and the rollups themselves are in charge of uh, data availability. Like they can either just download data from Espresso directly, or if they want, they can forward the data to layer one on their own to get additional data availability guarantees as a layer one, but Espresso doesn't uh, automatically do that. Oh, I see. And uh, the block here, so I see, so the block here contains, uh, what is sent is a, is a hash, 
Yeah, exactly. Correct? And as I understand, the blocks have the block has different um, pieces that are referring to different rollups, right? Yeah. So if a specific rollup wants to have data availability always in L1, they would have to. So after this block is submitted, they would have to follow through submitting their specific piece to L1 with a proof that this piece is contained here. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure you actually need an additional proof because like that commitment is sent to the layer one by Espresso already. Um, maybe Benedict knows. Okay, one has to, to think a bit more about this. Uh, so yeah, the there's an important correction. The the block submission actually the contents can be optionally sent to L1 or not, but it's not going to be done by Express itself, rather by by the L2 nodes. Yeah. Um, I think I already talked about all these points. Um, but the most important point is that the different depths that live in their own depth chain can talk to Espresso separately. Okay, so I said that, oh, sorry, let's just go back. I said that there's this API, this API here, this API. These are three things we have to talk about. You're gonna start with the REST API. So you see the L2 node could be thought of as a, being as slightly more complex. There is the execution part, which is basically our current node with its database. And an extra piece would have to be added, uh, which plays two roles. So I wrote here JSON RPC, but this is not enforced by Espresso. It could be any API. Currently, some of the things that this offers in, uh, have an overlap with the GraphQL API we, we already offer. So you see the users can talk to the service to get to inspect the state of the node. This we already have, but it would have to add another uh, entry point to submit transactions with signatures. So this piece would forward these transactions to Espresso, but not immediately because they have to check with inspect state if the user is actually paying for such a submission, right? So. Here's how it works. The user will send the transaction to this service. The service would check with the, um, the actual logic of the dApp. If this user has enough balance and if the transaction pays the fees correctly. So if everything looks all right, this node will submit the transaction to Espresso. Uh, there is a bit more to talk about this submission here. There is the the builder proposal, builder proposal um, relationship that we're going to talk more about later. But basically, the, the this serves as a gatekeeper that only sends transactions to Espresso once it has been properly cleared by the balance here, and also this. Um, this is an optional thing. This service can get from Espresso the transactions that have been received and confirmed, but not yet uh, committed to L1. So if you want to have a low latency node, this service can get from Espresso this uh, unconfirmed transactions and execute them so that they inspect states uh, from now on already are up to date. Uh, this, of course, is a service that has to be done if we are to move forward with this integration, but it's smaller than some of the alternatives we considered. Uh, you see, the basic 
components that we have to, to think about is extending our GraphQL API to have this extra functionality of talking to Espresso and increase a bit the functionality of the Cartesi machine itself by adding, adding some, some wallet with specific features inside the Cartesi machine. This will be talked about in more detail later, but this is what basically needed to be focused on the development efforts. Okay, so I said there is also an API between Hotshot and L1. So the um, Espresso from time to time will submit a block to L1. As we look at corrected, this will not contain the data availability. It's going to be just a commitment. But this sequencer contract um, is part of Espresso's infrastructure, but it can confirm to rollups the the content of those blocks the hashes of the, the content of those blocks so it means that during disputes if the validator arrives to a certain instruction that fetches input data the sequencer contract will be able to to confirm through some proof that the the correct hash is uh, was present in a certain block. So the it's important that we understand the sequence of contract that this facing this part that faces the the fraud proof. Um, this is what I thought uh, was getting into L1, but it's not quite because there's no content. But Anyway, it's, uh, it's a hash of something like this. Please, again, correct me uh, if I made any misunderstanding in my reading. So you have a, a big block that contains uh, sub-blocks from different rollups. It could be a monolithic rollup like Arbitrum or a depth-specific one. And these blocks will have an ID because every rollup has a different ID in uh, Espresso. So when you send the transaction, you actually send the ID together with it. So you see that Arbitrum has a unique ID for the whole of Arbitrum, but in case of Cartels, you would have a different ID for every dApp. So these transactions are tied to the ID. Uh, and the content of this block is merkelized in a way that if I want to, to extract the hash of a certain transaction, uh, I can offer a proof of this. So during prod proofs, I do not need to insert the whole block in the Cartesi machine as was previously thought. Uh, even yesterday I was discussing with Diego and I, thought that this whole block would have to end up in the Cartesi machine, but apparently not. This is already merkelized to the point that you can uh, insert a single transaction into the, the fraud proof system. You don't have to navigate this block to find the transactions. This means, of course, that our disputes will have to be a bit more espresso specific to have to take into account the way in which this block is organized and it will be a bit more complex because you'd have to add a step for with the proof right which you already did in the early version of uh, rollups where we would add a proof in every meta operation Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the proposal builder separation. So Espresso is fully compatible with this idea. So if we go back to the early slides, like here, where we think of the um, of roll of the node L2 node as something kind of monolithic that has lots of responsibilities, this can be further 
simplified by sending some of what I thought were its responsibilities up the chain. So what do I mean by this? So just like in Ethereum, uh, the original concept of Ethereum was the miners would receive transactions in some sort of peer-to-peer -peer network. So they would handpick those that paid big, bigger fees, build a block, and try to mine this block to add it to the chain. So this means that the person uh, is doing two works at the same time. They are at the same time building the block and proposing the block to the chain. So Ethereum uh, came up with this separation where someone would build the block, talk into the peer-to-peer -peer network, build the block, but not uh, submit it, actually send it to proposers. This really looks like something is being proposed here, but it's uh, the proposer is this service here. And the proposer is actually doing the submission to the blockchain. So what's the advantage for Ethereum in this separation? Because um, the type of profile of these two operations is very different. So if it's the same person doing both building and proposal, they'll have to know how to do these two things. So building is something that became very complex with uh, the arrival of uh, NAV, right? So now you have to really know how to pick your transactions and especially, you know, maybe alter them or front run them in order to extract value. So this became very complex, lucrative. So some nodes are specialized in this. While proposing, you know, before it used to be that you need a big uh, computing power to do hash operations. Now you need a lot of stake. So it's not clear that people who are able to extract MEV were the same people who were able to uh, mine big blocks, either by having lots of proof of work or lots of stake. So you have a separation that now allows someone to focus on MEV and propose the block that actually this, there is some commit review I'm simplifying things here, but there is some commit review that uh, makes it impossible for the proposer to open this block and repeat it to, to become also the builder and profit twice. So this, the builder is gonna show something to the proposer only with a price tag, say, okay, if you put this block there, you're gonna get this much. And the proposer who has a lot of stake will do the on-chain submission. Separation is very healthy, and it's also interesting in the case of uh, sequencing. The reason being completely different, uh, but okay, also a bit related. So you see, the proposer doesn't need to understand the content of the transactions. Actually, they accept to propose a block even before the review phase where they would know the content of the block. So it means that it doesn't even have to run the EVM in principle, right? Okay, kind of. Uh, so this is useful for us because in our case, so running the EVM, as I said, is something you can do with one uh, small PC. But in our case, there will be several dApps. So we don't want to run all of them. So the builder can be dApp specific. So the builder can be someone, instead of someone who understands a lot about MEV, it's going to be someone who understands a lot about a specific DApp. So the builder is a DApp-specific builder. They know a lot about the DApp. It's uh, validating. And in particular, it knows how to calculate the balances of everyone and know if everyone has enough balance to pay the fees. And when it wraps up a block, it's convinced that this block is going to pay the, himself the fees. So it can give the proposer an encapsulated block that reads, 
okay here there are many transactions from different users you don't have to understand them you, you can't even read them actually but if you put this on l1 now i'm gonna pay you this much and the advantage is that the proposer who's you know doing all the bundling of different boxes like this and actually doing the the submission to l1 the proposer doesn't have to understand the app logic so it's kind of a middleman between the, the the app and the the person doing the l1 dirt work so as i wrote here the builder is the one only one knowing the rollup specific logic it gets the transaction now there is a choice here for l for ethereum this has to be a peer-to-peer -peer network here there can be a choice the builder can be released into a certain port in a web 2 style and receiving these transactions from the users and forwarding them to to the proposer so there is no peer-to-peer comp -peer complexity in the in the builder infrastructure and also there is no that specific complexity to the proposal logic. Uh, as it reads in, in Espresso's documentation, the proposer only knows the total utility you get from submitting a block. It doesn't know the internals. So that's it. I, I'm gonna finish with a brief overview of the fees and how they work. So end users, we we'll we'll need to have some certain balance in L2. So there is the whole uh, Cartesian network discussion that I'm leaving on purpose away from this. Let's simplify, imagine that certain user is interacting with a certain DAP, say an RPG, and they have a balance in that RPG, enough to pay for fees. This is an overshoot, but let's imagine it like this. So, the users would sign a transaction that authorizes a fee payment towards the builder. And then sends this transaction, say through a web two endpoint, for the builder to collect and pack these transactions to send to the proposer. So after this, the the proposer will bundle them together and send to L1. But you still have to decide. I don't know if this is already part of Espresso's uh, protocol or if this is uh, flexible, how the proposer will get paid. Because, you know, it's a, it could be anything, it could be. Please, Luca, yes. Yeah, we actually have a, <laughs> we have a call later today to discuss this internally but our, our current thinking is that um we have an enshrined fee ledger within espresso um so i mean espresso as you mentioned earlier like it's it's a consensus algorithm but it's also just it's basically a blockchain and part of that blockchain will then be uh this fee ledger and our idea is that, as you mentioned here, that builders are in a position to collect fees from end users within like these app specific rollups or even just, you know, EVM rollups. Um, but because our proposers aren't aware of, of, of the internal logic of all these rollups, what we, what we think will be easiest, at least from our proposer perspective, is for builders to pay fees within espresso so so let's say the builder gets you know one dollar worth of uh fees within the, the the layer two like this this gaming layer two then within their internal uh balance they'll convert you know okay we have one dollar of this then that means we can you know pay 99 cents to the espresso proposer within their uh within the espresso sequence or blockchain basically like that's how we're thinking about this um i think there's a, a few additional things like i mentioned earlier um 
Espresso isn't directly sending transactions to the layer one. So if a rollup wants additional DA guarantees by posting transactions to layer one, then they also need to charge fees for that, um, which is, I guess, something you do at the VM level. Um, and finally, you probably also need to charge fees for execution, which I guess might just be paid to the, to the builder. But yeah, I think that those, those are sort of the three things I guess the fee for sequencing, the fee for DA, and the fee for execution. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, if it, so basically I'm, what I'm understanding is that the current perspective is that this is not an enshrined L2, but an enshrined uh, L1, uh, espresso L1, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, or we're calling it an, an L1.5 because it sort of fits between the layer twos and the layer ones. But yeah, it's like it's just a, a blockchain where builders can come in and pay fees. I see. And to finish, I'd like to to explain a little bit the, um, the development effort from the perspective I see now. Of course, this can change, but Looking back at the early picture we had, so users interact with some Cartesian node that is the app specific again. And this node currently does not have this endpoint, although it has the uh, GraphQL endpoint, but to have this additional builder style uh, functionality. Is it bundled with the uh, node i don't know that's a good question but makes sense also yeah makes sense either way it exposes either some extra functionality to the graphql or a whole new subset of json rpc the most important aspect is to have a, a submit raw transactions so just a second. Yeah. So the most important thing would be for it to accept raw trans signed transactions. It would then inspect the state of the DApp and ask itself: Is this transaction being paid for? Uh, if yes, include in the block. Once the block is full, dispatch it to the proposal. So this would be one extra piece of functionality. The the node would have to act but for it to work it would need to talk to the, the app so of course it could be uh, every the app has to do it but our current understanding is that the it would offer some library that every the app would basically inherit automatically which has some wallet with balances and so on and it can answer the question that the, so the node has a, a Cartesian machine inside, right? So it would be able to ask if there is enough um, balance but to this wallet offering some endpoints of inspect state. And it would be also responsible for parsing the inputs. So in, since an input arrives to the, to the Cartesian machine, if it has anything that is specific of the express way Espresso bundles the transactions, the wallet would also uh, parse this, which is basically what we currently do with the HTTP API. Uh, yeah, maybe the wallet could be part of the HTTP API. I don't know. We, have stuff to decide, but there are basically two big pieces to be done, one in the node and one inside the Cartesian machine. None of them is carried big, but they have to work in tandem and also in tandem with Espresso. So I don't think it's a, it's a trivial task, but it's smaller than we previously thought it's good news. And yeah, I'd like to end with this. Thank you so much. And if you want to to jump into a 
more informal discussion. Now it's great. I'll stop recording to make people more relaxed. <laughs>